each medium of art has areas that they excel in. For books, you can leave details up to the reader's imagination, and music can more easily convey a certain mood. However, more than any other medium, video games tend to lend themselves great to immersion, since your actions are responsible for the events that unfold in front of you. Wouldn't it make sense if you could peer through the eyes of the protagonist? This idea may have first entered the brains of Steve Cawley, Greg Thompson, and Howard Palmer in high school when they had developed Maze, also known as Maze War. It might have been one of the first, if not the first, first-person shooter. In 1973, it originally started out as a fluid simulation software in a work-study program at NASA's Arc in Silicon Valley before it turned into the idea of Maze War. Gameplay featured shooting opponents in a orthographic maze to score points. At first, the multiplayer was only limited to the connection between two computers, but eventually they would switch to using ARPANET when the students moved into MIT, leading to various changes like a maximum of 8 players, computer controlled players, a spectator mode, and customizable maps. It was incredible how ahead of its time this game seemed with its features, even when the internet was in its infancy, showing similarities to games that wouldn't release until decades later. It's funny considering this game was created in the same year as Pong. The next milestone in the genre was when id Software's programmer, John Carmack, experimented with the technique of rendering graphics that looked three-dimensional. He used a method of rendering called ray casting, not to be confused with ray tracing. Ray casting was a technique where the computer used many lines to scan across the in-game scene to tell what was visible to the camera. He first tried this technique with the games Hover Tank 3D and Catacomb 3D before using the tech in the more well-known Wolfenstein 3D. This was not actual 3D rendering, but it was merely an illusion. This was why all the maps consisted of a single floor and why you couldn't look up or down. Yet the fact that the graphics seemed like it was 3D was a major step towards high fidelity graphics in gaming. Wolfenstein 3D was influential for the time since it was the first time most people had ever seen anything like it. Compared to other games released around the same time, it stuck out like a sore thumb due to it not conforming to conventional 2D graphics, with the exception of maybe Mario Kart. Wolfenstein 3D would be a catalyst for other id software games to come which would somehow be even more influential. One famous game also made by id would build off the foundation set by the game, and it would be... Doom. Just like Wolfenstein 3D, Doom's maps were still designed on a 2D plane. However, there were now sectors that could have a height value for the ceiling and floor, allowing for stairs and such. Outside of mapping, there was now code for a z-axis, which did not exist previously. This can be proven by cacodemons being able to fly, and projectiles flying over your head. There was a common misconception that the z-axis did not exist in the game, because you could not move your camera vertically, but you could still hit enemies anyway. However, weapons in Doom have auto-aim on the z-axis, as shown by this footage. With these new additions, many Doom fans today debate whether to call the game 3D or not. But I will not be concluding whether it is, but just know that there were still no floors under another, and certain scenarios that would require calculations on the z-axis were not calculated for performance reasons. So it leads some people to not consider Doom as a fully 3D game. But that was just the game itself. When considering the ramifications of the game's release, it sent shockwaves throughout the entire gaming industry. The very violent nature of the game sparked controversy, would boast a powerful modding scene that still holds strong decades later, and many companies would try to write off the success of Doom by copying its gameplay, which led to the so-called Doom clones. This is a bit of a tangent, but there is also another common misconception that Doom and Wolfenstein 3D had not used mouse and was keyboard only. This can be disproven by this tweet by John Romero himself. The reason why people believe this was because people on MS-DOS were more familiar with keyboard controls than mouse 
because not everyone owned a mouse, so the default controls were keyboard only. But mouse controls were there from day one. Doom was definitely an influential game, but personally, the title that I would crown King as most influential would be Quake. Quake compared to its predecessors had opened up new game design opportunities for levels now that the game was rendering things in 3D. You could now have floors beneath other floors, finally! Lighting was now more realistic instead of the previous lighting by Sector and Doom. Muzzle flashes could light up the world around you as well. However, Quake wasn't the first real-time 3D game, so why was it so influential? I believe it was because of the community it helped to inspire. Quake had helped to pioneer multiplayer deathmatches as they started to gain traction in the late 90s. One avid player going by the name of Thresh had made WASD and mouse movement the standard of movement in FPS games. So next time you boot up a game and see the default controls as WASD and mouse, you can thank Thresh. At this point, first person shooter was not a term yet at the time of Quake's release, until very close to the turn of the millennium. Around that point, there were two game series that found their roots as Quake mods, Team Fortress and Half-Life. I'll talk about Team Fortress later because that'll come into effect, but as of now, let's talk about Half-Life. After Gabe Newell and Mike Harrington left Microsoft to start their own company, Valve, they started work on Half-Life as their first game. The development of the game was very turbulent, facing many issues. They initially struggled with finding a publisher since the game was seen as too ambitious for the time. They would then find Sierra Entertainment who would agree to publish the game. Later, Valve showcased what they had of the game at E3 1997 and planned to release the game in the same year but had decided to delay the game due to being unhappy with the state of the game. Finally, in November 1998, the game was finally released to critical acclaim. The game showed AI for NPCs which was very new for the time. Scientists could cower and run away if you shot at them, or if they were approached by enemies. Security guards would be friendly at first, but hostile if you shot at them. People like to joke now that the AI for cockroaches was better than the pedestrians in Cyberpunk 2077. On top of the AI for the game, it was a very big breakthrough for video game immersion. Games before either had little to no story in the game or cutscenes that stripped you of your controls. Half-Life did not use cutscenes for the entire game except for one exception. Valve initially planned to use traditional cutscenes in the game but had not implemented them due to time constraints, so they opted for something else. Instead of having the game strip away the very essence that makes games unique, the story of Half-Life was told physically in the world. It helped that you were the one interacting with the world as well. It was not just Gordon Freeman causing the resonance cascade, you did too. I think someone either at Valve or Sierra was aware of how different these deviations were from regular FPS shooters for the time. That the tagline of the game became, Run, Think, Shoot, Live. After the release of Half-Life, there were various mods of the game like Quake before it. Day of Defeat, Counter-Strike, and many more. Valve's next game would be Half-Life 2, which introduced realistic physics interactions into the mainstream, not to mention the top-of-the-line graphics that focused on realistic lighting. The physics engine was actually integrated into the gameplay like with a gravity gun, and was not just for decoration. This created incredible amounts of hype surrounding the game as people were wowed by the game at E3. The game was delayed by over a year, causing major backlash. What makes matters worse was that on September 19th, 2003, the source code of the game was leaked and spread online. Before long, people had figured out how to compile the game and get an early, playable version of the game. The leaks were catastrophic for Valve, as the leaks showed the game was far from being finished, leading to even more backlash. After long, grueling months filled with crunch time, the game would finally be released in 2004. 
Later in 2006, the hacker responsible for the leaks was found and arrested, sentenced to two years of probation. I think it's time to go back to Team Fortress now. In 1996, Team Fortress started out as a mod for Quake by Robin Walker, John Cook, and Ian Colley. The three had been inspired by a Doom map called Fortress.Wad and decided to make a team-based shooter where different classes had different abilities and weapons. Valve would catch wind of this mod and decided to hire the developers to work on a port for Half-Life's modified Quake engine, leading to Team Fortress Classic in 1999. Team Fortress 2 would begin development after Team Fortress Classic and went through multiple design overhauls across many years before deciding on an art deco art style inspired by JC Leyendecker. Team Fortress 2 would release in 2007 inside the orange box. The game was paid at first, but after 2011 in the Uber update, the game would become free to play. Team Fortress 2 is influential in adopting various new models for multiplayer FPS games that are still used today, such as microtransactions and continuous free updates after release, which contrasted subscription-based games like World of Warcraft. It was also more casual oriented with an emphasis on silhouette and color based character designs slash environments that helped them to stand out in the game world. Without the rim lighting, the characters tend to blend into the scenery. With the rim lighting, which you can see specifically on the heavy's shoulders, neck, and head in this example, our characters are visible against the rest of the scene and better fit the art style of Team Fortress 2. Alongside Team Fortress 2, Portal had also been released in the orange box. It was a fascinating puzzle game taking advantage of the Half-Life 2 physics engine to create gameplay around physics and portals. It was a game that pushed back against the common criticism in media that video games were violent. Thus far, I've only talked about games that have influenced other games, but what about some examples of games that are products of that influence? Overwatch had taken inspiration from Team Fortress 2, and it is pretty evident. Overwatch was almost going to have a PvE game mode at the time of making this video. Fighting against robots with upgrades? Who could have heard that from? Overwatch and Counter-Strike also inspired the creation of Valorant. Just like Team Fortress 2, it was inspired by JC Leyendecker's art style, evident by the silhouette-based character design. In Minecraft, there's an easter egg to Quake if you set the FOV to maximum, referencing how some Quake players had extremely high FOVs. I hope you enjoyed this video. It really wasn't the highest quality video essay out there, but it's my first. If you want to see more videos like this on my channel, then make sure to like the video and subscribe to show you like this kind of video. Um, that's it. The video's over. <laughs>